This series has been powerful. Today we are on part three, and the series is titled Broken Heart. And with this series, what I'm trying to show you guys is that no matter what happens in life, no matter how crushed your heart may feel today, who has left you, who has broken you, God can always restore. He can always heal a broken heart. It doesn't matter what you've been through or who left you. God would never leave you. He would never forsake you. And he can bring healing into your life right now. And I get it because there's a lot of good people who have been through some very difficult situations or hard things, or have had people that they love and that they trusted lead them. And I know, I know at times you can feel completely alone. So thank you for being here today, because I want to share with you that you're never alone, that God is always with you. I love this, Psalm chapter 120, verse 1, I took my troubles to the Lord. I cried out to him, and what happened? He answered my prayers. God will always answer. He will always reveal But listen, you have to ask. You have to ask, you have to be in his presence, and you have to wait and listen to what he wants to reveal to you in order for your heart to be healed. But today I want to talk about an interesting topic. I'm going to talk about the topic of chasing more, and that's also the title of today's message, Chasing More. And it's that little voice inside of our head that tells us if you just had more of this in your life, your life would look better. If you had more of that, if you had a relationship like them or a house like that, you would be perfect, right? Isn't that what goes through your head every single day, especially the moment you get on social media like, so-and-so got a new car? How they get a new car? They're more in debt than us. Like, how? I want this in my life. I need more of this so that I know. And and when I listen to people and I see the comments online or I see, you know, what we say in-house in and what we're dealing with. Sometimes we feel like, well, we need more of this to feel satisfied in life, to have a purpose. And so I see some people that's constantly chasing a career, all right? If I achieve this and get this goal in my life, then finally I can prove to everybody I'm somebody. And I can take that picture, post it on Facebook. People are going to like it and share it. And they're going to know, mom, I made it. Okay, moving out of the basement this month, it's going to happen, right? (laughs) Hallelujah. Some moms in the room like, please, Jesus, please, please. But I've also seen people chase relationships. Come on. Chase relationships for purpose and meaning. And I think on every dating show that you see on TV today, they say it like this. If I just find my person, find my person, then I'll have worth. You already have worth. In Jesus Christ. And that is the most important relationship you can have. But I get it because the world attacks us and we see all these things and we want this. And I also see people chasing money. Chasing money. If I just get this amount of success in my life, then finally I can stop calling the bank (laughs) and telling them, don't don't do the overdraft. I I got a reason why this happened. Because it can be real, right? For some of us, It could be comical, but for some of us, we're living this day by day, and it ruins our mind. God, I feel like such a failure because I can't pay my bills right now. And I'm struggling, and I'm trying to do my best, and I feel alone. Everybody has a relationship, and I feel like I have no purpose. I have nothing in life. And the reason I wanted to put this subject in the Broken Heart series is because a lot of us, and I've noticed this too, even when you see success... I've seen people give up everything, chase a goal their entire life just to achieve it. And it's not what they thought it would be. And when they get there, they question everything. How come I still feel depressed? How come on the inside, I'm still not filling up that void that's inside of my heart? What is going on in my life? How do I deal with this? And King Solomon mentions this pursuit of purpose a lot out of the book of Ecclesiastes with a very famous phrase. He stated it like this. This is like chasing the the wind, meaning trying to chase something that you can't catch, running after something that is constantly running away from you. All right. And I started to think about this. Now, these are running shoes. And as you can see, these are not mine. Okay. They do not fit my feet. These are my wife's. She loves to run. I like to sit down and eat donuts while she runs. So that's my goal. Okay, don't judge me. 
Uh, but recently, my son decided he wants to train for a 5K. And as a father, I'm like, yeah, come on, let's go out there. Let's see you train. Let's get all this ready. And I, I looked at the how much it was going to cost. I'm like, okay, we could budget that. It'd be fine. It'd be fine. But then all of a sudden, more expenses started to show up. Because now I realize, you know, it's funny too, that now he's about to be in a race. He comes up and says, daddy, my toes hurt in my shoes. And guess what that means? Oh, if you're going to run this 5k, that means you need brand new shoes. Not only did he need brand new running shoes, but he's also like, I'd like to train. And my wife's like, you know, it'd be a great idea to get a little iPod so we can listen to music. I'm like, okay, all right, we'll get that too. And we're doing all these things. But I realized, and then we ordered these shoes and these shoes come in and they're so cool. I'm like, all right, put them on. Guess what? They're too big. They're too big. And so he's trying to run in these things. And every time they're flopping around and it's no good for a 5K. But guess what? He can grow into them. So let's buy other shoes. God, what is going on right now? I thought we were training for a 5K. But he's chasing this dream, and I'm proud of him for that, because that's a goal, and I want that for his life. But do you realize a lot of us are chasing dreams and goals, but we're not wearing the right shoes? We're not prepared the way we should be. Our priority is out of order. For a lot of us, the priority is the big vision, what I want. If I get that, then everything will be okay. And when the priority gets out of whack, guess what? The purpose gets out of whack. Because it would be very foolish for my son to show up to a 5K with shoes that don't fit him. In the same way, I'm telling you today, you're fighting a fight. This is a spiritual battle around us, and you have to prepare your hearts for this battle. Yet none of us are diving into the word of God. We're not ready for that because our priorities are out of whack. I want this, God. Later, though, me and you are going to have a better relationship. Right? Right? It gets out of whack. And so this is why King Solomon said, this is like chasing the wind. And imagine this being your devotional for the day. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse 14. He said, I observed everything going on under the sun. It's all meaningless. The job, meaningless. The achievements, meaningless. The relationships, meaningless. Everything that I have gained in my life is all meaningless. It is like chasing the wind, chasing what you cannot have. What if I ended the message right there? Thank you for coming. Please be back next week for more encouragement, right? It's, it's hard, but here, okay, this is good. Don't miss the point. Because Solomon is not saying you can't achieve these goals in life right? Chasing the wind doesn't mean you can't achieve the goals that you have because you can catch fame. Guess what King Solomon did? He was the most famous man on earth at his time. Everybody knew about his wealth and his wisdom. Not only that, but King Solomon is not saying you can't catch riches and power and status because he had all of that too. So what is King Solomon actually saying? He says, you can catch all of that all these accomplishments and all these goals and still miss the purpose of life and the meaning behind it all. That's what he's stating. Yeah, and it's not a bad thing to have goals. I wish success for all of you, for your relationships, for your business. If you want to be famous, go ahead. Do it for Jesus. But don't miss the meaning behind the reason you are here and the relationship that Christ wants to have with you today. Because listen, in the end, I don't want you to be devastated. I don't want you to have resentment. God, I thought this would fill that void that I have, but I just keep wanting more. Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse 10. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth can bring us actual true happiness and death. Because guess what? When you start making $100,000, that's my goal, right? God, come on, leave me there. Somebody else is making 200000 Okay, that's nice too. I'll do that. Somebody else is making even more. Somebody else is a millionaire. God, all right. And he's like, he's chasing the wind. And you get there, but you keep wanting more. When will it actually satisfy you? 
When will it be done? Can I ask you right now, what are you chasing? What are you chasing? If you were writing it down right now, what am I chasing? Now, here's the bigger question and the perspective I want to change for you today. Are you chasing your purpose or are you chasing God's purpose? Because it's a difference. There's a big difference. Or will you end up in life? Are you chasing your purpose? God, I want this. I want the house. I want the relationship. I want the money. I want all of these things. And then I will be happy. Or are you chasing God and believing that what he has for you is good? Because I've noticed in my own life, I'm chasing after things in my life that God is saying to me, look up. You're not chasing me. You're chasing these things. Don't you know I will place it in your hand when you chase me? But your priorities are out of order. And because of that, your life starts to get out of whack. And, and, and I want to talk about King Solomon because there's a lot to learn about Solomon. Solomon is King David's son, and he was born from one of the most tragic love triangles in the entire Bible. All right. His mother's name is Bathsheba. King David killed her actual husband, had an affair, had a baby. That baby died. And then all of a sudden Solomon comes in to the picture. But here's something that should encourage you today. No matter how messed up the family situation was, God loves Solomon because he loves life. And every person here, no matter what mess you came out of, or what your family looks like. I think everybody's family is crazy. Let's just go ahead and admit it, okay? We look normal on the outside, but everybody's got a little crazy in them. Look, God has you here for a reason and a purpose. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 24 and 25, when Bathsheba became pregnant and gave birth to a son, David named him Solomon. And the Lord loved the child and sent word through Nathan the prophet that they should name him Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord as the Lord had commanded. God loves you and has a purpose for your life. But we see Solomon grows up. And we know that in the beginning, he walked in the ways of God, okay? And, and there was a lot of family drama. We've talked about this before because it wasn't just like, hey, King David died and Solomon gets into kingship. No, he had a lot of other brothers. There were a lot of mixed families in this mix that wanted to become the king, but God knew who would be king and it would be Solomon. And so he comes into the presence of God. He's speaking to God and God asks him this question that many of us would die for today. What did he ask him? First Kings chapter three, verses five through 15. That night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and God said, what do you want? Okay, God, all right, I like, okay. He said, ask and I will give it to you. Right now, what would you say? Like, okay, all right. For me personally, I might ask to be Batman. I'm just gonna be real with you. God, if there's a possibility, I heard about Samson, can I be Batman? You know, can this happen? But imagine this question coming your way right now with your priorities and with what you're chasing. Now look closely at how Solomon replied to the Lord because he pleased the Lord. How did he please the Lord? Let's look together. Solomon replied, God, you showed great and faithful love to your servant, my father, David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you, and you have continued to show great and faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Pay attention to how Solomon is talking to God and why it pleased God. First of all, Solomon is giving praise to the Lord. A lot of us miss that in our prayers with Jesus. When we're praying to God, a lot of us are like, God, please do this. Thank you for that. I would like that. Amen. Thank you for this food. But he's giving praise to the Lord. God, I recognize that it's a miracle that I'm about to be king because I had a brother who wanted to kill me to take me out. I realize that my family is a little messed up and we've been through a lot of things, but God, I thank you that the kingdom is still here and you have protected everything that we have today. Only by your glory do we have what we have. And then second, listen to this, he's honest with God. 
He's honest with God. He asks God about what he needs, but he's also showing his real fear. God, I would love this, and I'm about to tell you what that is. I would love this, but I'm afraid I'm not good enough to do it. I'm afraid that I don't have the ability to be able to handle this responsibility. God wants you to have such a close relationship with him. Listen to me. He wants you to tell him about your fears. Listen, so he can make your fears look foolish in the end and show you who really is in control. But this is how Solomon replied, verses 7 through 9. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father, David. But listen, I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your one chosen people, a nation so great and numerous that they cannot be counted. Now listen to this. I want you to underline this part. God, give me an understanding heart. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between what? Right and wrong. Can I ask you a question? When is the last time you prayed to God and asked for an understanding heart? To understand right from wrong. God, this person hurt me. And it can be so easy to pray that, God, I just just give them something. Like make them have a weird rash on their foot or just just something in their life. I don't like them. But what does an understanding heart do? God, you forgive me every day. I don't know what that person has been through. And I don't like it right? But my feelings aren't the boss of me anymore. My feelings don't control my actions. Remember, I told you that the word of God was sent to correct our feelings. And God created you to feel. Why? Because that's how you have a relationship with him. But his word corrects our feelings. And so does the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. And so when we pray about an understanding heart, listen to me, you're starting to see people the way God sees them. Because I've noticed myself at times looking at somebody like, oh, man, they may seem harsh. I don't want anything to do with them. I'm going to be over here. And God says, pray for them. No. I don't want to go over there. I don't want to pray for them. That's uncomfortable. I don't want to do it. But God says, pray for them. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what I have for them. And I want to use you to do it. And guess what happens? Your faith starts to increase because you see that God can use you no matter the situation. When you have a what? An understanding heart. And because of that, it puts our feelings in check. And listen, here's what's so good about it. When you put your heart in the right place with God, because he is a good father, he always blesses more than you can imagine. I have seen this in my own life. Every time I did something uncomfortable or sacrificed something, God always gave more than I could have imagined. 1 Kings 3, 12 through 14, God said, listen, Solomon, I'm gonna give you what you ask for. I'm going to give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one as else had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for. Listen to this, riches and fame. And no other king in the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And that's where a lot of us say, okay, amen, walk away. There's one more verse. Hold on. Don't forget this. Continue verse 14. If you follow me, if you obey me and my decrees and my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. All these blessings, the desires of your heart, what you want to see happen in your life, I will give it to you and more. But do not forget to follow me and set your eyes on me always. And around 2012, I remember having a vision. And I was pursuing evangelism in Louisiana. And I was with my team. And I had prayed. And I I just saw this this stadium. There's an independent stadium in Shreveport, Louisiana, 
A lot of college games are played there. Football is big there. Baseball is big there. So everybody would travel to the stadium and pack it out for sports events, concerts, all these different things. And I remember praying with the team, and I just had this vision. Like, People are going to come here to worship God. People are going to travel to this, this stadium to, to be in the presence of God. There's going to be a church service happening here, and it's going to be full. And I remember hearing that right away and like, listen, y'all got to listen to this. God has shown me this. We're going to believe in it. We're going to believe that he's going to do something, and then we're going to pray over it. And so I remember, and, and to be honest with you, Shreveport can get a little shady, especially at night. Not so safe all the time, but we would go down to the independent stadium at night and we would actually lay hands all over the stadium and say, in Jesus name, there's going to be something great here. There's going to be a revival here. God is going to do something big. And we believed it. We were crazy about it. We were there all the time praying for it. And then a few years go by and it didn't happen yet. But listen, eventually it happened. There was an event taking place there, and people were coming there to worship God. There was going to be a church service. People were going to praise God. Hallelujah. My team was like, man, isn't that awesome? God confirmed it because they had dreams too. They had visions of this too. They knew God would do it before we actually saw it take place, and everybody was excited except me. I'm going to be very real with you today. I wasn't excited because... It wasn't me. See, God had given me this vision, and he showed me this revival that was going to take place. In my mind, I was preaching it. In my mind, I was the one there with the crowd full to hear about Jesus. In my mind, it was going to be me. And God said to me, no. And I remember my heart felt broken. Everybody's so happy, and every time they brought it up, I felt devastated on the inside and allowed the, the enemy to get in my head because I kept hearing lies. You failed. You did something wrong. God didn't want to use you, so you failed. Everything's crashing down. And then at that time, too, my evangelism, evangelistic ministry was starting to end, and I just felt like, God, what do you have for me now? Because this is really getting difficult. Did I, did I fail you? Did I do something wrong? I'm so angry right now, and I felt depressed. And I remember being in the presence of God and just praying, God, why? What did I do wrong? Now listen. And God spoke to me and said, did it happen? Yes. Was it confirmed? Yes. Did people worship my name? Yes, Lord. Did people hear the gospel? Yes, Lord. Then what's the problem? Are you pursuing God's kingdom or your own? And I remember at that moment, I knew the answer. Of course, God already knew the answer. I just didn't want to say it out loud. I was angry at the situation because it wasn't me. God said, I have great things for you that I'm going to place in your hands. But until the priority is right, you'll never understand my purpose. Because when you get to that position in life, when it happens, you glorify my character. Your character is not ready. And it broke me. And it was hard. There may be things in your life right now you want to achieve. You're watching somebody else achieve it, and it hurts. There may be things in your life when it comes to a relationship, like I said, or a house and all these things. And you're like, God, did I fail you? Did I do something wrong? And God is speaking to you saying right now, you're just not ready for that. You're not ready. And the story of Solomon demonstrates that if our hearts are not constantly pursuing God, it is so easy to let ourselves get in the way. It is so easy to put our own selfish ambition in the way, get everything out of whack, running a race without the right shoes and frustrated in the end. And it proves that what you chase, listen to me, can also change you. Let me ask you this. What are you giving up to chase what you want? What are you giving up to chase what you want because chase the chase itself is a temptation i have seen families broken up because a spouse desired a chase 
and they've left the family, they broke the family, hardship, everybody's broken, and in the end, it's not what they thought it would be. Guess what? Because the chase and the thrill is over. And so what do they start to pursue? More of a chase, and a chase, a chase, a chase again. In the same way, I've seen people chase achievements and try to get there as quick as they possibly can, running this race that they're not prepared for, leave their family, leave everything that they love behind just to find out it did not bring them the joy they thought it would. This is what it means to chase the wind. Guess what? When you're chasing the wrong things, it can change you. Do you understand even Satan used to be an angel? Even Satan used to be an angel until he what? Until he chased his own glory for them to worship him. He wanted to be exalted upon the throne of God. So God kicked him out. And Jesus said he fell like lightning. What do we know about King Solomon? We know a few things. Solomon was known as the wisest man on earth. According to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, he composed some 3,000 proverbs and wrote 1,005 songs, okay? This was a talent definitely passed down by his father, King David, who was also a musician. He was also very famous and wealthy. And the story tells us that even the queen of Sheba came to visit him and look at his palace and look at everything that he had done and accomplished. And she said his wisdom was mind-blowing. Everything that was rumored about him was true. You could also say he was good with the ladies, okay? He really loved the ladies. First Kings chapter 11, verse 3. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. He was the original Mr. Mr. Steal Your Girl, okay? So if you don't understand that joke, that's okay. We're going to keep moving on. Just open up the Bible. We'll be fine. But he loved the ladies, yet he had all these things. Do you understand it? He had everything that the world tells us to go after, the money, the fame, the power, the status, the relationship, everything. Yet he wrote one of the most depressing books out of the entire Bible. Why? What went wrong? Let me say it like this, too. What you chase determines the prize you will receive. Be careful that what you are chasing is of God and not of the world, because listen, you might not like the prize in the end. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 4. In Solomon's old age, they, his wives and his concubines, turned his heart to worship other gods. Instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God as his father David had been, Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Now listen to this. I need you to understand how bad this is. Because when we hear about these idols, sometimes we check out. And I was going to show you a picture, but she's completely naked, so we're not going to do that. The idol is. Um, But I want to talk about these idols real quick. Ashtoreth was believed to be the goddess of sexuality and fertility. Okay, listen to how bad it gets. There's an article stating that according to the worship of Ashtoreth, what they would do, they would bring in virgins, okay, and they would force them to prostitution. And if they were not willing to do this, guess what would happen to them? They would be sacrificed to the goddess. Solomon built that. Because of his wives, because of their influence, because of his chasing something, a meaning, a purpose. He built this temple where women were being sacrificed for prostitution. This idea of nudity and sexuality in it. Don't you understand? It hasn't gone away. It is deep within our culture today. And it will control the mind, it will control the heart, and it will make people chase lust in such a way that they break everything that they know. It's on TV, it's on social media, it is everywhere you look. Why? And the world tells you, chase it, it will bring you life. But the Bible says adultery and lust, it will kill the soul. It destroys your heart and your worth and who you are and what's realistic and what God has for you because all that's a fantasy. It's not real. It's not real. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32. But the man who commits adultery is an utter fool. 
because he destroys himself. And other translations state it like this. He destroys his own soul when he allows this to overtake his life. Do not allow this idol to become what controls your heart or the chase of your heart. But the next is even worse. Molech is the demon god of the Ammonites. And in worship of this idol, listen to this, children were sacrificed by fire. They would bring their newborn child to this idol. The hands of the idol would be hot and they would place their baby on the hands until the baby burned to death in worship of this God. 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 10, and this is in the future when it was destroyed, but it proves this. Then the king defiled the altar of Topheth in the valley of ben Hinnom, so no one could ever again use it to sacrifice a son or daughter in the fire as an offering to Molech. And this idol Molech was located and worshipped in Tophet. And the word Tophet comes from the word Toph, meaning drum. And the, the reason it means drum is because when they sacrificed their child, they would bang a drum so the parents could not hear the scream of the baby burning alive. See how evil Satan is. You see how evil these, these customs were, do you understand why God was constantly telling the Israelites, do not follow the customs of the world? Do not be like everybody else, worshiping what they worship. It brings death into the situation. It brings death into your life. It is the same thing today. Do not worship the ways of the world. It brings death. It brings such devastation into your life. It will break your heart. God says, I'm the only one that can heal your heart but you have been neglecting the word, word to chase the world. And my question is, Solomon, how could you take it this far? How could you be so blind that you would let it get this bad? And again, I've seen people still in the same situation because they want the chase. We just talked about it. They're so blind, they'll leave everything. Leave everything behind and allow this hurt. Listen. Here's a warning for you today. If this has been going through your head lately and you feel like your life is not enough, what you have is not enough, the devil is shooting all kinds of temptations of what you could have, okay? If you feel like your marriage right now, that there's no love in it, then guess what? It is time to seek God, put him back in the center and figure out how to love again and do your best. And I get it. And we talked about that last week. There's some situations that are very difficult, but pray to God and trust him through the process and he can heal the broken heart. And even if the worst happens in your situation, you will never be alone because God will be with you. You keep your eyes on God to follow him because guess what? When you're hurt, what do we want to do? We want to get back at them or we want to do our own thing or go to the club or do all these different things. And it brings more devastation, more heartbreak. How do you get to this point? I want to show you what we can learn from the actions of Solomon, how he got to this point, but also we're going to reveal to you the consequence that comes out of this. So question, how did Solomon become so lost? The answer is that Solomon did not remember God's word. So simple yet profound, because it would change your life. He forgot the word of the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. Listen to this. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And I commanded him concerning this thing that he should not follow other gods. But he did not what? He did not observe he did not remember. He did not obey what the Lord had commanded him to do. Listen to me. He did not observe. He did not remember. He did not get back into the word of God. Let me tell you, God may bless you, but don't allow those blessings to become your God. Because it's in that situation, guess what? When we're going through trials, God, please. When we're going through something hard, God, please. When we become comfortable, And that's when the devil tries to make his move. 
Oh, you're not in the word anymore. You're not seeking God. Guess what? Over here. You can have this. Don't you want more? Don't you need more of what you have? It is not enough. What did he forget? This is what the Lord had commanded. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Verse 2, listen to this. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. Let this wake you up today. Are there things in your life that you're not obeying God for just because you want what you want? Are there things that you're chasing right now that you know that God is against, but because you feel like you need it in your life, you're still doing it right now? Is a relationship, are you jumping into relationships just to feel purpose? Run away from God because you you want this, this identity in yourself and your relationship because everybody else has it, but you're not even looking at your relationship in Christ, your identity in Christ, who came to redeem you and restore you. I'm telling you, we're jumping into these things that we think will satisfy us. And all of us are born thinking because of TV and, and, and social media and all these things that the relationship is going to fulfill my purpose. Do you know in heaven, as sad as this may sound, you're not going to be married? In the kingdom of heaven, why? Because marriage is a picture of God. And it's that relationship with him that is above all else. And guess what? Because this is mind-blowing. In heaven, every relationship you have will be perfect and better than anything found on this earth because it's in the presence of God. So who are you living for? Is it your purpose or are you living for the purpose of God? Listen to this. What is the consequence? Enemies. Enemies. Listen to this. When you reject God's direction, you reject God's protection. When you reject God's direction, God, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to jump in this relationship. God's like, I'll be here. You're going to be hurt. But I'll be here when you come back. But there needs to be something that changes. You need to know your identity in me and what I have for you. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 11. So now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept my covenant or have, disobe- and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and I will give it to one of your servants. Now listen to me. This is what's so good about the character of God. He always keeps his word and his covenant. So he didn't allow the kingdom to fully diminish or, or leave, but he kept the tribe of Judah because out of the tribe of Judah, comes Jesus Christ, and he kept this because of his promise to King David that no matter what rebellion is happening right now or what the enemy is throwing, guess what? The devil will not get his way because what God has established will take place. And you could be along for the ride or you could walk away. It doesn't matter, but it's still going to happen. God's purpose is still going to take place. But enemies started to rise up because of this rebellion, and ultimately it was not ripped out of Solomon's hands. It was ripped out of his son's. 1 Kings 11, verse 14 and 23. Then the Lord raised up Hadid the Edomite, the member of Edom's royal family, to be Solomon's adversary. Verse 23, God also raised up Reason, son of Eliada, as Solomon's adversary. Enemies started to rise up, but guess what? They were going to attack his son, who was also very rebellious and did not care for the Lord. As a parent, Think about your actions. Are you following God? Because it may not affect you right away, but it can ultimately affect your children for the rest of their life. Man, that's powerful. And so walk in the ways of the Lord. Be an example. Even when your emotions are going crazy, God, I can't handle it. Yeah, but look, they're watching you. They're watching you. And God wants to show his love and his glory through you, even when you're hurting Because that's how you heal. That's how he starts to heal a broken heart. God doesn't want you to see enemies rise up. Because when you start to live selfishly, you'll notice enemies coming over here, enemies over there. They're saying this about you. They're going to do this. All these things start to rise up when you live life for yourself. 
Now, let me ask you this question, because a lot of people would read that and be like, well, that's mean for God to do that to Solomon. Why would he tear the kingdom apart if God did not do this? Listen, more innocent women and children would have been sacrificed to demonic gods. And this is why God had to rip this away and bring it back. God does not want you to be so blinded by the chase that you lose all that truly matters in your life. And I get it that a lot of us are at different walks in life. Some of us are being tempted right now. Some of us have already chased the wrong things. And some of us are hurt because of the aftermath of somebody we love doing this. So how do we see healing? And how do we fight this battle back so that our hearts are not broken? I want to learn two points from Solomon's mistakes that will help you protect your heart and also see healing today. The first point is this. You need to guard your mind. You need to guard your mind. Why? Because the battle will start in your head. From the moment you wake up, do you understand everything you watch and listen to is trying to plant thoughts in your mind about how to live and how you need to think? And so understand that the ruler of this world, lowercase g, God is allowing Satan to rule this world. He's trying to influence you in every way possible to think the way he thinks. But only by the word of God are we set free from this. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by doing what? Changing the way you think. Not going back to your old ways, your old habits, or how you used to talk, but changing the way you think. I have hope now because of what God has told me. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. When God transforms your mind, you understand his will, which means you understand the priority that he comes first, which means you understand his purpose. Listen to me. When the priority is out of order, purpose is out of order. Right? Again, how could you run a race and chase something and reach the finish line with the wrong shoes. If your priority and your purpose is just to reach the finish line, then you also have to prepare and train for what you have to do. So let me ask you this, what are you chasing? Right now, seriously, what are you chasing? I've asked you before, are you chasing a status, a relationship, your worth? Because this is all we hear in our culture today. Now let me blow your mind because I believe this is powerful. Your worth and your status comes from your relationship with Christ. The relationship you will have for all eternity. And like I said, why, why? Because in the end, it will be the only relationship you've ever had without criticism, without hurt, without abandonment, without resentment, without separation, without rejection, without pain. It's a perfect relationship, listen to me, this world cannot offer. And so, but all I hear and all I see is I'm looking for the relationship, I'm looking for status, I'm looking for worth. It's only found in Jesus. It's only found in Jesus. Revelation chapter 21, verse three and four. Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them. They will be his people. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more addiction, no more suffering, no heartbreak. None of that, it's all gone. All these things are gone forever because the relationship that you were designed to have above all is with Jesus Christ. God the Father, that's what will end up in the end. Don't allow this very short time that we have on earth to make you chase the wrong things. Please, don't allow it to hurt you. You need to guard your mind. And my last point is this that I want to share with you. You need to guard your focus. You need to guard your focus because what you see also affects the heart. And what you're allowing into your body could affect your reactions and actions. And Jesus said it, you know, your eye is the lamp of the body. 
Are you allowing good light into your heart or bad light? Are you allowing something into your life right now that's going to help you? Or are you going back to the addiction because you're hurt? It's funny how our flesh will always justify going back to numb a pain, feel pleasure in a moment. And God is stating, listen, what I have for you is true healing. The world can offer numbness or numb it, but I'm going to offer healing. But what do you want? Because until you understand the priority that God needs to come first and the purpose that he has for you, you'll always desire the things of the world. What do you want? Do you want to be set free? Then it's time for a change today. It's time to start following him, even when it's hard, even when you don't feel like it, even when it hurts and everybody else has left you. God is not going to leave you. But you need to guard your focus because just like the battle being in your mind, the devil is constantly trying to put things in front of your eyes, but it's also our flesh. When you're tempted, do you want to look at it or do you want to look at the word of God? Think about it in that moment. Whatever it is, it's attacking you. It's hard. It's hard to say, God, I want to look at your word right now. Why? Because you know it's actually going to bring freedom. As God said, and Jesus spoke, there is no temptation that will overtake you. In every temptation that comes your way, there will always be a way to escape, meaning the devil cannot control you. He cannot make you do anything. What I have for you is good. I'm going to show you my power over and over, but you have to guard your focus. First John chapter 2, verse 16. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. A craving for everything that we see. And pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father. Listen to me. These are from the world. And I started to think about that revival. I started to think about what God did on my heart because I'm telling you today, my priority was out of whack. I wanted this to be achieved so people can look and say, hey, look, he did it. Look at the anointed man of God. Look what he did. Look at what he was able to accomplish. He's not a failure. We know his past, but look what God's done through him now. And God said, you're not ready yet. Listen, are you chasing something right now that God wants to place in your hand? Listen to me. Then you need to chase him first because I realize that love, the power that we want to see in our life only comes through sacrifice. For Jesus sacrificed his body upon the cross so that we can be redeemed and restored. True happiness, listen to me, it's not getting what you want to feel purpose. True happiness is realizing that sacrifice leads to my real purpose. True sacrifice to glorify him. John the Baptist said it like this, John chapter 3, verse 30. He must become greater and greater so that I must become less and less. Like I said, when God is your priority, you don't have to chase it anymore because at the right time, in the right moment, he will place it into your hands. Matthew chapter six, verse 33. But seek first your goals, your achievements, your wants, your desires. No, seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and then all these things will be added to you. When Solomon was walking in obedience and asked for wisdom, God said, because of your obedience, I will give you more. But when you put first the kingdom of God, you understand what God is doing. And it was hard. That sacrifice was hard. But for this church to be here today, a lot of people had to sacrifice for the word of God to be preached out of here. For my own experience, God taught me that moving on faith, when I had no money in the bank account, nothing, scared to death, that was a sacrifice he wanted me to make. There were times that God put me in a position where I had to be humble because somebody almost 10 years younger than me who had way less experience was telling me what to do with the ministry. God told me to listen. You listen, you obey. When nobody's looking, you sacrifice your pride. 
You get rid of it. You take it out. You take out your ego. And that humility that I'm bringing upon you will get you further than that ego ever could. There's more sacrifice. And I remember battling in my head the times that I wanted to grab the mic or take the mic, and God's like, no, you're going to take out the trash. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> and every sacrifice... I was able to do it because I put him as the main priority because I learned my lesson. And for many of you too, you've been through it and you know, or maybe you're being tempted right now. Listen, do not allow God to slip out of the first priority in your life because everything else will become a mess if you do. Solomon allowed that to happen. So here's your warning. Don't allow it to happen because it will always lead to heartbreak. Can I have you stand right here? I'm going to ask our pastoral care team to come up front. This is a time of prayer. This is a time of, of repentance. Again, I don't know where you are today. Maybe you're being tempted. Maybe you want to leave your marriage. You want to leave your job. You want to leave everything in life. You just don't care anymore. And you're trying to chase all these other things because, yeah, it looks tempting. Listen to me. Your priorities are getting out of whack. Put God first again. Let his Holy Spirit convict you and show you the real truth so that you're not blinded by the chase. There are people in this room today that have testimonies of the heartbreak that that chase can bring, but also the glory of God and how that heart can still be healed in the presence of God. There are people today that you have already been through it and your heart is broken. Somebody you love, somebody you trusted has left you and hurt you, and now you're thinking, where's my value? Listen, it's still there. That person's sin or that person's action will not take away your value. The devil cannot take away your value. God has placed that value upon you. You are his. You are his child. He is yours. He will guide you. He will lead you. He will provide for you. He will protect you. Because in the end, that is the relationship that matters above all other relationships. The relationship with God is a picture of marriage itself. The holy trinity that can never be broken apart. The covenant that God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never abandon you. And I'll never hurt you. And maybe you need to pray today and come up front for that. Whatever it is, let me ask. Are you chasing your purpose? Or are you going to chase God's purpose? And trust in the damn. Hey guys, it's Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor, before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel, and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church, because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So we love our Authentic family and thank you today for joining us.